to say it again. Thank you so much, guys, for supporting this and for coming. And yes, sit back and relax. And yeah, Ivana, I think we can start. Okay, so I'll just uh, run by with you guys the house rules. So for this session, you guys are in listen-only mode. It means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. However, there is a chat button at the right side of your screen. We have a Q&A button as well. So if you have thoughts or any questions, feel free to ask anything. Uh, please don't be shy. Uh, we have a Q&A session right after the whole presentation. So any questions that you have, we will be addressing after the whole thing. We, I, we also wanted to say that we are also working from home. So this is not a professional environment. So if you hear anything weird in the background, if the connection disappears, or if you have to log out or you get disconnected, do not worry because we will be recording the whole session. So you will receive a copy of the whole presentation right after this uh, webinar and with the recording as well. So if you have colleagues who want to jump in, feel free because we will be sending the whole copy after this. And please share all over social media. Use the, use the hashtags talk push it real good. We forgot to change this. <laughs> but please talk feel free. Real good is fine. Definitely yeah. use talk push it real good. <laughs> Just use talk push it real good and hashtag maybe content writing for recruiters. And yes, please enjoy. So for today's session, we have Ivana from our marketing team. She's our in-house content writing rock star. So I'll leave it to her to introduce herself. Thanks, Blanche. And hi, guys. I'm Ivana. I'm super excited to be giving this webinar today. I love writing, and I think that recruitment lends itself to, to using it in very unique ways and building really great relationships. So I'm super excited to talk to you guys today, and I wanted to just thank you for coming. So let's get started. I think that the, the reason we should sort of discuss a little bit of the reason why we're here, why writing matters so much, especially when we talk about recruitment, because it's not a, an industry where you hear that, where you hear that writing is, is a really important skill level, but, but it turns out that it, that it really is. Because you guys are creating all types of content all the time, for your candidates, you're writing job descriptions, you're writing emails to them, you're following up on Facebook Messenger or even text messages. So you're, you're engaging with your candidates on social media and all these different platforms and that's all content, that's copy, that's writing. Especially nowadays where the, the biggest platforms we have for engagement are online. So, and the, and the best way we can connect online is through content and writing. So here's a few key things about why content matters. It drives actions on your career sites, it gets the potential candidate to apply, and then I think that this probably is the most important, it gives candidates information that they need in a digestible way. So you're actually giving them really valuable info that they wanna read. So it's important that we craft it in a way that makes them read it, retain it, and at least remember the, the most important things that they need to know. And the bottom line is, you know, good copy, which copy is just text, text on an email, text on a text, text anywhere. It, good copy gets someone to do something. But just like we need to write good copy, we need to be thinking about differentiation because it is really hard nowadays to differentiate ourselves. I think that we all know and we've all experienced it 24 7 information overload our inboxes are full all the time of for the most part really good content some other content that that's not so great we're getting linkedin messages all the time it's just information from all sides at all times so that causes a little bit of audience fatigue and now i want to ask you guys a question i i want to know how how many seconds you think that you have to catch a candidate's attention. And I'm gonna launch a little poll to see what you, what you guys answer and then I'll publish the results. Okay, poll is launched. 
I'll give you guys a few seconds just to answer how many seconds you think it takes to engage a candidate. Okay, some answers coming in. Awesome. Okay. Still answering. Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. And let's share the results. Okay, so most of you, 37%, thinks it takes eight seconds. And then the rest of you think 26% think seven, 22, six, and 15, four. Let's see who was right. The eight second, the eight second people were right. Goldfish actually have longer attention spans than your camera books. And this is actually a study that we found. So Blash can send you guys the link if you want to check it out. But it's pretty, pretty amazing that we've got eight seconds to attract our candidates to get their attention and get them to read whatever it is that we're putting out there. So we should keep this in mind whenever we're writing our content because competition is fierce. I mean, even if it's just an email, you're competing with a million other emails. So before we start into like the actual, you know, actionable insights that I want to talk about today, I wanted to ask a question, and this is also in the form of a poll. I wanted to know what you guys struggle with the most when drafting messages for your candidates. So I'm going to poll that now. And you guys can tell me. You can answer as many as you like. It's multiple choice, so it could be more than one. And if it's not any of these things, then you could just type it in the chat. Okay. I'm gonna give a few more seconds. I see people are still answering. Okay. So let's look at the results. So social media job posts seem to be the most difficult, or at least head scratching. Uh, then it's followed by reaching out by email, and then interacting on Facebook Messenger or SMS. And then job descriptions seem to be the easiest, so that's good news, I guess. I wonder, so I mean, it's also good news because we're gonna talk about all of these just now, so. Creating a content strategy for recruitment. Finally, we start why, for the reason that we're all here. So these are three things that I think really matter for whichever messaging you're creating. It doesn't matter if it's a job description, if it's an email, it's a, if it's a job post on social media. All of these, these three points should, should always be kept in mind to create messaging that resonates with your audience. So first you need to know your target audience and that's really gonna define your tone. And I think that recruiters in this aspect probably have a really good advantage because you guys interact with your audience all the time and you're familiar with these people and you have relationships with them. So, so you have a pretty good idea of who they are. And I think that's really, really useful knowledge that we should take advantage of it, advantage of when we're drafting our messages and, and picking which tone. And then we should always identify the purpose. And this goes for every piece of copy. Why is it important that the candidate reads this message? And that's gonna drive your intention for every single line of that email, of that message, of that job description. And then once you read through it and you find stuff that doesn't really service your purpose, you can get rid of it. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to save candidates time and make their lives easier. So any extra information, we don't need it. And then the last point is relate your information to them. How does it affect them? Always make it personal. And, and the way that you can do this is just relate all the information or all the value back to their life. And I think an example could be, for example, if you are talking about a company benefit, like maybe your company offers three days work from home. I mean, I know now we're all working from home all day, but in nor normal circumstances, you have maybe a three day work from home policy every week. They can pick three days out of the week to do it. Instead of saying, my, uh, 
this company offers three days work from home a week. You could say like, you can spend three days out of the week with your family. You'll have time to cook lunch or pick up your kids or, re or just really make an example of real life of how that benefit translates. So the first point that I talked about is to know your audience, right? And marketing has a really cool trick for this. I know that you guys already probably know your audience really well, but this is fun and definitely helps. We make uh, persona strategies. And I actually want to know if, if any of you already make candidate personas or if you don't. So I'm going to launch a little poll and see what you guys are already doing. Couple more seconds. Lots of varying answers. Okay, and poll. So it seems like most of you are not, and then there's a mix between yes and sometimes. So I'm going to argue you should all do this and all the time. And the reason besides the fact that it's fun is because it really is going to help you employ the tone that you need for every type of job description. And that's going to increase your engagement and attract the right candidate because you know exactly who you're talking to. And the way that personas work, this is an example from the one that we use in TalkBush. We actually have divided our personas by our three main industries that are our customers. So most of our customers are either BPO, staffing, or retail. So this is an example of a persona that we made for BPO. And of course, we renamed her Betty. The, the point is that you kind of look at your, and you should do this for every job position. So you look at what the job position is and what the requirements and characteristics are of that job. And then you imagine the ideal person. So for example, if you have like, if you're looking for a mid manage mid-management mid job that requires college level education, you could say, okay, I'm looking for somebody that's in their, I don't know, 30 to 40s. I'm looking for somebody who has a college education that maybe they prefer chatting or, or on Facebook or via email. Maybe they don't like phone calls so much. Um, they're on social media all the time. Maybe they're tech savvy. Uh, all that kind of stuff are things that you write down about them. You give them a name and you give them a personality. You could even think about their family life. What does that look like? Are they married? Do they have kids? All that stuff is great information that you then all then you write down and you make a profile about this person. And then each time you write information about the job, you know you're writing to this person, if it's Susan or Steve, or, but you're writing to them. And then that's gonna make it so much easier because you're not just writing to this mass of candidates. You're talking to one person and that's gonna make it relatable to the mass of candidates. And then the other thing is define your goals. I, I, like I said before, um, every, write, every line you write needs to be service, in service of your intention. And I, like I was explaining before, the, the, the really important thing about doing this exercise is that you don't give superfluous information and that your candidate can instantly get the value from what you're giving them because you only have a few seconds to attract their attention. So it's really important that you keep it. And by having a clear purpose in mind, this goal will be so much easier. And then another thing that recruiters get to do, which is really great, is know your brand and showcase it. And you could do this in job, po in job postings and job descriptions and emails. You can do this all the time. And I picked this uh, Starbucks example because I, I really liked it. I thought it had a couple of really good things going. So, so here, the, what, what Starbucks is doing is they're taking advantage of, of their value, which is they really value diversity, right? And so they're bragging a little bit and they're saying that they, that they were proud to earn a top score on the corporate equality index. And, and this is a really, really great strategy for a job posting because at the same time that they're talking about a company value and being authentic about their, their true desire for diversity, they're giving the candidate 
value too because it's like okay i would like to work in a company that values diversity too so and then they finish it with a with a really short just interested in joining our team click the link in our bio so i think this is a really effective method just you know brag a little bit about a company value that's true and actual and also is attractive to candidates so now I want to talk about, I think that we just went over all that and right now it's still a little bit abstract maybe. So I want to go over the real actions and the real tips that you could just start applying. And with that, I am going to start with some examples. And you can see the headline says, keep it, keep it consistent, keep it simple. And I think that if you're to take away just one thing from, from the little webinar today, it would be that line, keep it consistent and keep it simple with everything you write. But we're gonna move on a little bit and talk about job descriptions. And I think that this is such a great opportunity for a differentiator because the majority of them tend to be so long and boring. So if yours isn't, you're already ahead of the game. So here is a really good one. Um, and it's great because right at the top, it has a simple explanation of duties. And then it does the spotlight on the core value, like, like Starbucks, like saying something, uh, taking advantage of, of a positive value that your company embodies. Then it defines uh, success and top performers. So this is good because you're relating it back to your candidate again. You're not making it so much about your company because and then the candidate doesn't care that much about that. They care about what you can offer them and what, they, and what you need from them. So that's great. And then this part where you see you're good at and extra awesome. These are just like the normal titles that, that job descriptions use all the time, like job requirements and skills, except just in a kind of more creative, original way, while still being really clear about what it is. Because yes, original headings are great. But then if you go too far in the opposite direction, like rock star, ninja, guru, then that, that stops making sense. And then what I like also is very structurally, it's, it's easy to read. There's a lot of white space. There's lots of bullet points. So that's great. It's much better than lot, like huge blocks of text that nobody wants to read. And, and also if you, this could use like a little bit more balding, but it's pretty great. And then this is another, uh, another example that I chose, but for different reasons. I like it for, first of all, it starts with a really transparent note. It says off the bat that this job requires to respond to mountains of emails. And this is important because, transparency is important because even if it's not like a great task that we love to do or that you don't think most candidates would appreciate, it's really important that they know that that's part of the job so that you can actually pick and make the best selection, increasing your retention and, and you know, skipping surprises ahead. So transparency, always important. And then this is cool. Instead of saying like duties, it's more of like a description in the day of in the life. So I thought that was cool because it's a different way of saying what the candidate's supposed to do, but kind of painting a more like dynamic picture of what the job would be like. And then this is always, always, always a good practice, addressing the candidate as you. And also whenever you, you draft messages like, directly to candidates, not necessarily in job description, but you should always use I, not we. So always a personal tone, always the first person. And then jargon-free attributes of job performers. This is such a big one. You see so many job descriptions that, that get so complicated for, for no reason. So steer away as much as you can from like overcomplicated words and technicisms and use very short sentences. Uh, I, there's this marketing guru that I love, the XCMO of Drift, Dave Gerhard. He says to write choppy copy, and, and I love it. What that means is you should just write really short sentences to the point, followed by periods, 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 instead of like run-ons and commas and commas, because that's just so much easier to read, and it's more like how you talk. It's conversational, and content should be always conversational, and especially recruitment, because it's so personal. It's so intimate. It's... It's, such, it's about building relationships. So I put in this little graphic here, the source, I can send it to you after the webinar. 
but I think I, it was, it's, it's interesting to see which parts of the job description are considered the most important by candidates because then that can help us really highlight what we need to when we're writing a job description. So compensation obviously is at the top at 61%. And that doesn't mean that we're gonna start our job description with like salary, but that does mean that we need to make it prominent somewhere, that we need to make it bold, that, that it needs to be easy to find. Then it's followed by qualifications, job details, performance goals. All these things need to be really clear and easy to find with bolded titles and, and bullets so that candidates can hone in on what they care about. And then if you notice, company mission, career growth, company details are the least important. So what that means is, for example, that about us section that so, so many companies have at the top, it shouldn't be at the top. It could be at the bottom. So let's talk a little bit about what to avoid. We've been talking about what, what to do. So going in the opposite direction, uh, what I just said, starting with an identical about us section at the top, because candidates, well, they care more about themselves for one. And also Google, if you're trying to get in top search result rankings, if you have too many about us sections, all identical, Google takes it as a duplicate and then you go down on search results. So not great. And then avoid complex speak. And these are just like a couple examples. So for example, about is always better than approximately. Find is always better than ascertain. Help is always better than assist. And then it's not because your candidates don't understand these words. Of course they do. But just because it just makes for a more pleasant reading experience. And then Avoid using gender biased titles like salesman because then you could be alienating like half of your talent pool. And then missing to include benefits is a biggie because sometimes when writing job descriptions, we, we think like maybe we don't have to include a benefit because they're somewhere else. They're on our career website or they're on our, on our website or whatever. But if you don't include it in the job description, then candidates that maybe are applying for a job board won't see it. And I found this in, in a study that says that each benefit you include actually increases your apply rate by one to 5%. So I think that's pretty incredible and a missed opportunity if we don't include them. And then this one, typos and grammar mistakes. It's such a dumb mistake to make, but candidates honestly they might not apply if they spot one themselves because it does really lower a company's credibility in their eyes so my advice here would be like to thoroughly edit double check and triple check and ask your co-workers to check it if it's something that's going to go live and, and reach a big number of people it's definitely important to do that and here is a job posting that's not so great I think that automatically we can tell it's a lot different than the other ones. I mean, there's so much test, te text, all these acronyms, the, these titles aren't like creative or fun. Or, I, it doesn't really make you want to read it. And it might be a great job, but if there is a job description right next to it, or if a candidate just keeps scrolling and finds something that they'd rather read, then that could mean that you lost a lead. So definitely think about structure, think about technicisms and think about keeping it light while still being professional and informational. And now moving on to job ads. Job ads are such a great way to get a lot of traffic very fast. So they definitely matter. And here are two examples that I like. This first one, I like it because of the copy. I think that if you have a great design team or if you have great design skills, that's, that's great. But, but honestly, copy is half the battle. So look, let's read this one. We want you, we're hiring rule breakers, questioners, straight A students who skip class. We want you. This is great ad copy for a job because it's sort of letting the candidates in on like the whole company culture and including them as part of it already. And it speaks to, to the, their target audience really clearly. So that's a really great example. And then this one, Verizon, is a great example too for, for a different reason, but it still accomplishes the same of letting the candidates sort of in on the inside because they're talking about hiring 
developers. And so what they do is they included like a little test for developers. So it's, it's cool because it's really thinking about their target audience. It's making an ad specifically for them that only sort of they can understand. And it's like, even before applying, they're kind of inside the company culture. So here's a couple of tips for, for writing ads. You should always treat your candidates like they're amazing. And you should always lead with what you offer. So what's your employee value proposition? Not really with what you need or who you are, but what you're offering them, because that's what they care the most about and that's what they're gonna read in those eight seconds. And then you should always highlight how much you value diversity and encourage candidates to be themselves, obviously. And then bonus points, if you include a real life picture of your team doing their thing, like that Starbucks one, which was really cute. And then if you insert a few company perks, that's always good. And if you can use humor, I mean, I don't think if, if your company is really, really serious and that's not really your tone, then you, you shouldn't have to force it. But if you can, and you can be a little bit more relaxed in the job ad, that always gets engagement. And then the most important, I think, is you relate to your target audience with specific interests to their skills or, you know, inside jokes of the industry, like that Verizon ad. So making them a part of, of your team or, or, or a feeling or appealing to them specifically already kind of makes them feel like they're part of your team and it makes them want to apply. So I think that what we've talked about, again, it's, it's still maybe a little bit abstract. So let's summarize with just a few quick tips that you can do right now in your next email or your next message or your next job description. So some actionable takeaways. Right in the first person, you and I and Owen, I just want to remind you guys that we'll be sending these slides so you'll have this just in case you want to go back to it. But yeah, so right in the first person, structure your messaging with bullets, white space and bolding. Remember to bold the parts that you really want your candidates attention drawn to and use this structure to your advantage in a way that makes candidates read first and remember what you, what you consider to be the most important. Use short sentences, use a conversational tone. You can get a little creative with the subheadings and the titles and the call to action. The call to action would be basically like apply today or apply now. You can change those up a little bit. And then keep your purpose and target audience in mind every time you write a piece of copy. Uh, we've been over this and it's super important. It really will define your tone and it will it will make it will increase your engagement because every every line that you write will have a purpose and then be clear about next steps always set expectations tell candidates exactly when they will when they will hear back from you or at least give them the time frame tell them what's going to happen next candidates live in a world of uncertainty most of the time companies aren't great or getting back to them so if you can differentiate yourself in this you you're already winning and then avoid using jargon and highly technical wording and then my last advice here would be to just test stuff. I think uh, we do this in marketing all the time. We're always testing and we, because we don't always know the perfect formula and because candidate attitudes are always changing. So you can test, you know, different e subject emails, different formats for job description, different ads, and then and see what works best. And then when you find something that really works, you then replicate that formula over and over again. And then eventually it'll probably stop working and you'll have to start testing again. But testing is always good and i don't think that we should be so scared to maybe not get so many open rates on one email or not get any conversions on a job description because that just means that that doesn't work and that we need to change it but from failure we find success so testing is always a good idea and especially in copy because so many things work and then they don't and then they do again so and then lastly i wanted to talk about utilizing tech to help you boost your message. I think that technology is such a great way for us to be able to take all this knowledge that we have on building human connections and relationships through our content and then apply it at scale to, to millions or thousands of candidates. So a good way to do this is with chatbots. With the right automation technology, you can create personalized messages and blast them to a big audience. And this little guy here is Cess from Transcom. He is powered by Talkfush, and he's a really cool guy, as you can see. 
Stas, Stas usually changes like what he's wearing and stuff depending on the season. And he has a really cool tone and it's all automated. So all this messaging that we were, t that we we're talking about, you can make it happen 24 seven all the time instantly. But since we have this technology and we're using chatbots, we need to know how to adapt messaging to each channel because there are so many and they're not all created equal. There is Facebook Messenger, there's texting on your phone, there is email, there is WhatsApp. There's all these different ways to communicate with candidates. So first we need to find out where they like to spend their time and let them be the ones to choose where they wanna continue the conversation. And once they choose and they've made that choice, then we have to make sure that our messaging message ma matches the medium. So here are quick tips for the, the three most popular. Facebook Messenger, this is our time to have fun. I think that Facebook Messenger lends itself to lots of gifts, to lots of humor, to lots of intimacy and personalization. And it's, it's really your time to showcase the serious side of your company and, and really kind of have fun with the candidates, right? And then this is an, another example for, from Sess. Facebook Messenger is also an excellent method to re-engage. And in this little picture, this is exactly what Sess is doing. So when a candidate kind of drops off the process or, or stops answering and leaves their application halfway, Sess will send this message of, we miss you with this little Puss in Boots guy from Shrek. So it's fun and it definitely gets a response. And then, SMS, text messaging, this needs to be your shortest type of copy. You should definitely steer away from long blocks of text and include only the necessary information. Uh, emojis welcome, or yeah, actually encouraged. And so what's important to note about this channel is that it's an intimate channel, so we need to use it wisely. This is where candidates also talk to their family and their friends. So the fact that we're there is kind of a privilege. So we need to do everything we can to avoid being spammy and on and unobtrusive. This is a great, uh, a great medium for follow-ups and reminders. Uh, always use a personal tone and be authentic. And lastly, email. So a couple of best practices for email is subject lines should be 10 words max because anything else gets cut off. Uh, you should use first names for your candidates and for yourself. Uh, this is longer form content, so you can provide more detailed information. You can still use GIFs and emojis whenever it's relevant. Uh, what's really important about emails is that, especially candidate recruiter emails, is that they're not so focused on clicks. So if you really need to send the candidate somewhere, like to your career website or something, only include that link. But any other type of information that they might need that's on your website, it's just easier if you write it out on the email. Because any as more, many as many more call to actions as you keep adding, the less chance that they'll click. And don't forget your best personal tone and to test what works. And lastly, I, I wanna conclude on this note of authenticity. I think that it's really important that whenever we're writing, we really stick to being ourselves and showcasing who we truly are, because that's what gets the best results. Millennials and Gen Z make up 38% of the workforce. And these guys, they can spot automated emails and advertisements and sponsored content from a mile away. So what, what we do to appeal to them is, is just, you know, being human, steering away from, from that corpy kind of message and just showing, up, showing them who we truly are and what we stand for. And they can see that and they appreciate that. And that makes them want to engage with us more. But you guys are the experts, so, and you already know what you need to say. So the last thing I'm going to say is don't overthink it that much and just have fun with it because writing can be fun. And now I think it's time for Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much, Azana, for that. We actually have a, quite a few questions. So let me just... So first question, it's from David. So how, may, how much research does it take for you to create the personas? Actually, there are three questions that are, that are around that. So another one was never really had experience writing candidate personas. Is there a formula that we can use? 
Okay. And the second one is, how do you approach researching your candidate personas? Is there a certain criteria or format that you follow? Yes. So, yes, it involves research and it involves a lot of research. I think that you can go off of what you already know about them and then start from there. Um, look at other, look, look at, for example, Facebook is a good way to do this. So if you're looking, for example, for college grads, you can start looking at Facebook profiles of college grads and like the, the skills that you're looking for. You can also do this on LinkedIn and just go into their prof profiles and gather as much information as you can from there and sort of mine all that data, all that data and start making your, your profiles. But it, it's honestly, it's really also based on generalizations. Um, and it's just a way to really put a face to your audience. Yeah, and I think we can share, you can check out the copy that we put here, the example that we put here. So we'll, sh we'll share with you the slides. Yeah. Do that. And then we have another question. Should we be limiting our job descriptions to a certain number of words? I think nobody reads them. I think you already answered this. Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't have a specific number of words, but definitely shorter is always better. So if you can make them as short as you can while still getting all the information that you need in there is fine. And if you, and if you can eliminate certain, certain parts like the about us section, I think that's also fine. Yeah, there was another question related to the job description actually, which is pretty interesting. Uh, what do you think about not disclosing salaries in the job description? We have positions where we cannot advertise the pay. Yeah, I think that's understandable and it really depends on the industry and the level of job. Um, I don't think, I think it's fine as long as it makes sense for, for the job offer and the industry. Mm -hmm. But if you can include it, I mean, always try. Ooh, just a follow-up question from my part. How about, how about if the job, if, if that's the case and you can't really disclose the salary, what would you recommend we highlight or we blast instead? In that case, you should definitely try to highlight any perks and company values that, are, that you have here. Um, company, uh, sort of office life, company life, Anything that makes you a good place to work, to take advantage of that and highlight it. And you know, if you have a company trip every year, write that in there. If you have a really good work from home policy, write that in there. If you have childcare, write that in there. Any extra benefit that applies to your candidate and their, um, to your audience, write it in there. Yeah, yeah, pretty. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think like a lot of um, our candidates, especially the millennials and the Gen Z, they're really looking for the EVPs and the benefits instead of really the salary. The, the, so that's a really good insight, Ivana. Thanks for that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Millennials and Gen Z, I mean, it's not like they don't care about salary, but most of their jobs offer kind of the same packages. There's no difference there. So they really care about career growth. They really care about social consciousness. So if your company is doing anything with charity, anything like that, also include it because they want to know and it interests them. Yeah. Yes. We have quite a few more questions uh, from an, another anonymous attendee. How do you decide the tone of the content? How do you decide the tone of the content? So this is a great question. And I think how you decide the tone is by your audience. Who your audience is, that's part one. And so depending on who your audience is, that will inform how you talk to them. Uh, and then part two is who your company is, what your employer brand is. So if you put those two together, that kind of gives you the recipe for what the tone that you should employ. And tone can vary from channel to channel. It's not, it's, we wouldn't talk to a candidate on Facebook Messenger the same way that maybe we would reach out via email. So those three things kind of will comprise what your tone is. Okay. We have another question. Given the current situation, do you have recommendations on how to approach writing messages to sound more authentic? What must we include in our messages? This is the, so, such a tough question and something that marketing is dealing with constantly because 
as the crisis has advanced and people have, have, have started talking more and more about it, every single email that you get starts with, like, I know times are tough or the COVID-19 crisis or I hope you're staying well. So it can come across as unauthentic and I totally get where you're coming from. I think that a way that we're kind of getting around that is not explicitly just saying like COVID-19 or times are tough, but rather than doing that, just talking about an action or a consequence that is happening or that can help them because of COVID-19, but more not so explicitly, you know what I mean? So just providing them with value and not necessarily saying like, because times are tough, you need this. Ah, yeah, because I've actually been seeing a lot of those covid yes. I'm sort of tough. Do you have like ideas if if that's does that like put some of the candidates off or is that yeah, what is I, the, I'm sorry, what? Like what is the do you have like stats behind that or um I don't is it that new? yeah. Well I, I I don't have like specific stats on 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 how many candidates are get put off by COVID nineteen um emails, but I do know that there's probably a little bit of audience fatigue behind that. So it, I'm not saying don't talk about it, of course talk about it, but talk about it in a way that makes sense. And for example, instead of saying like, I know that you're stuck at home because of the crisis, um, this is just an example, like a general example. You could say like, um, are you bored or do you need help connecting with your, with your team or whatever it is that you're trying to tell them, but not so much like times are hard and no, no, no. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And we still have seven questions. Feel free to keep asking, guys, because we have 15 minutes left. So here's another question. How about subject lines for email? Do you have recommendations that can increase open rates? Yes. So my main recommendation is to test. Um, you could even do maybe like an A-B test. So you send out one email, the, the same content with two different subject lines and then see what gets the most open rates. But some proven ones that work are, for example, lists. So including like a number, seven things, eight things, so eight steps. So for example, if, if you're uh, emailing about a job position, you could be like three easy steps to apply to this job. That, that usually works. And then a uh, good tip on email, subjects is to always make it really clear what the email is going to be about and another thing that works is including even their first name in the subject line mm. yeah. huh. and i think it's quite related to the previous question but do you have recommendations on what to read on what to what what to read maybe this is about uh content writing in general what to read yeah yeah. Um, yes, I think you should all follow Dave Gerhardt on LinkedIn. He's the content writer, writer master. And then there's a lot of good content on Drift's website on emailing, and they have a lot of free templates and resources. Uh, I, I, I can include the links on the follow-up email to this. But yeah, those two, I think, are my main ones right now please include that in the follow-up email so that they can refer back to it. Another question. What are your thoughts about rejecting unqualified candidates? We normally just send them a template message if they don't qualify, and sometimes there are candidates who, who gets upset. Uh, yeah. I think that uh, sending a template message is better than not sending anything at all. Candidates should always hear back from us, even if the answer is negative. So, so that's a point in your favor for sure. Um, of course, it's disappointing, but at the end of the day, the candidate experience is much better if they do hear back than if they don't. Uh, you could you know, work on the template to make it friendlier, and something that helps is maybe if you encourage them to reapply after a period of time. So you could say like, we're always looking for, for great talent, um, just apply, feel free to apply again in six months and, and we look forward to hearing back from you. Something like that might encourage them to apply again and, and not feel so bad. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Feedback is definitely essential. Uh, 
here we have another. Can we, use, can we also use a survey to gather data for a candidate persona? Yeah, for sure. Surveys are awesome. You should totally do that. You could even, like for example, if you get one candidate to apply to the job and that, that candidate is your dream candidate, you could use that candidate as a reference and you could call them up and be like, hey, I'm running this survey and ask them questions or ask her or him questions and use them to build your persona. We have, we're down to our last three questions and we still have 13 minutes. So if you still have questions, feel free to ask. If we don't get to answer, you can always email Ivana or me and we'll get back to your questions as soon as possible. So last three, uh, what is the ideal number of caption for a social media posting? Uh, is this, yeah, I think what you're referring to the number of words or the length for a social media posting. Wait, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I was reading the chat box. <laughs> Here, uh, it's what is the ideal number of caption for a social media posting? The ideal number of, of captions? Yes, I think it, they're referring to the length of the post. Am I right? Okay, so for a social media posting, there are two different types of length. Uh, for ads, it's a little bit different than for just a regular post. For a regular post, you have a little bit more leeway before that read more shows up. But I think the sweet spot, and then, and then for ads, you have like not that much. So it's like two lines. But the sweet spot for either one is before the read more. So it has to be pretty, pretty concise, about two, two or three lines at the most. Oh, okay. Because usually when, when they read more appears, some candidates have to click to read more they most likely they won't. So they'll only get those three lines that you wrote. Okay. Uh, another question. What can you say ads by headhunters, not disclosing the company name, but creating traffic on social media? Would you suggest such practice? Uh, what can you say ads by headhunters, not disclosing the company name? I think for some, for some uh, companies, they do not put the company name, they just put the ah. top title. So would you suggest such practice? Like not putting the company name in the job title, but having the company name somewhere else on the job description? I think it's not having the company name at all. Because like some companies, they just put a job description and not explain I don't, which I don't, That's That's definitely not, not a good practice. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then... How about creating videos? Do you have best practices on those? Videos, yes. So if you can make a job description with a video, that's awesome. And my few tips on videos would be make it short. Don't make it longer than, nine, than about 50 seconds to one minute. Uh, make a script beforehand or make just a little outline so that it, it doesn't sound that rehearsed. And have your the director of the department or your hiring, ma hiring manager uh, make the video and you could embed it right on your career website. You can publish it on LinkedIn, you can publish it on Instagram, on Facebook, and it, it's really a good way to get some engagement. Talk push it all the time. Okay, yes, it's definitely because the shorter the video, the better. Definitely. And we have one last question. So if you we still have a few minutes, so if you still have other questions, feel free to type it in. But for our last question, uh, going once, anyone? Okay, so is it professional to use hashtag for social media posts to attract Gen Zs? To attract who? Gen Zs in particular. Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, it's not unprofessional. Uh, hashtags are a great way for people to discover your content. So what is important that, about hashtags is kind of developing a smart hashtag strategy. And this you can do researching Instagram and Twitter, and even just like a quick Google search will tell you what hashtags are popular in your industry and using those. So if you're using hashtags that your audience is following and looking for, it's definitely a, a, a good way to get more leads, get more engagement, and get more eyes on that. So I definitely recommend using hashtags smartly, but yeah. I have a 
follow-up question for that. How, how many hashtags do you think we should be including in one? Because like personally, when I do, when I post something for recruitment or for marketing, it's a lot. I put a lot and I don't know if it's, if it's a good one. What do you think? So uh, this is, I think, my personal opinion on this. I think there's like a LinkedIn hashtag etiquette, a Facebook hashtag etiquette, a Twitter hashtag etiquette, and then Instagram hashtag etiquette. So for Instagram, I, I'd say put as many as you want, as many as Instagram allows. Uh, for LinkedIn, I don't know why I think like five, six, seven is like a good number. Uh, Twitter, I, you, you could use like three, four. It's, Twitter doesn't let you use that, that that many characters, but hashtags on Twitter don't matter that much anyway, because the content gets picked up whether it's in a hashtag or not. People can just search for words and not hashtags. And then hashtags on Facebook don't matter at, at all. Cool. Okay, thank you. I'll definitely take that into mind. And we actually have two more questions, oh, three more questions coming in. Uh, Okay, so what are social, me social media platforms that you can suggest to pool candidates? To pool candidates. So it depends on your audience. But I know millennials are on Instagram and Facebook. Gen Z is on Instagram and TikTok. Um, and LinkedIn is a really good way to pool candidates too, especially with higher education. And then job boards are good for more operational jobs. Mm. Uh, we have two more questions. Do bullet points work for job ad copies? Yes, definitely. Uh, are you talking about social media ads? Job ad copies, I think. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, they work, but they have to be within that, that limit. So you get maybe like two bullets, three. Mm, okay. Unless, I mean, sometimes there's no way to get around to read more and, and you just go for it and some people will read it, but it's always better to avoid if you can. Yeah. And one last question. What's the best way to deal with negative comments directed towards the company online? So I think, and, and this is a little bit outside of my expertise, it's a little bit PR, but a way to deal with negative comments, I think, is to address them head on and, and, and address the concerns of the person who's making negative comments. It's definitely a bad practice to delete the comment without even following up. Because uh, if somebody happens to see the comment was there and then it wasn't and screenshots on the internet. So avoid that. But definitely try to follow up with the person if you can in private and get them to remove their post. Uh, and you can offer them an incentive or ask or, or try to correct whatever the perceived wrong was. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so thank you, Ivana. That was that was great insight. Uh, I, I'm sure we, we have a lot of questions. We had a lot of questions coming in, so that's really good. Thank you, everyone, for attending. If you have any more questions or do you, do you have any last words for everyone, Ivana? Um, no, just thank you so much. I enjoyed being here. I had a lot of fun talking about writing and I hope that it was helpful. You, yeah. um, I, I'm going to write my contact information right here in the chat just in case you guys want to email me and we can talk some more, share tips. That's my email. Yes. And if you have questions for her, just reach out to Ivana or me, add her up on LinkedIn. And thank you so much for your time. I know it's quite late in the calm, but thank you for joining us. And yes, thank you everyone and have a good day. And we'll see you at the next webinar. Bye and stay tuned for more. Bye, thank you.